Stocks are a pretty good inflation hedge, it appears. But yeah, you're not really getting ahead. The, the whole financial independence retire early or, or the whole fire movement was based on this kind of old model. This is what we now know as like a fiat model. Bitcoin has completely shifted that paradigm. What I'm most interested in is separation of money from state. Saving for your future should be gratifying. I'm always a really big believer in paying yourself actually first. If I adopt Bitcoin, housing is getting affordable. If everybody adopts Bitcoin, housing is getting affordable for everybody. But it does it uh, mean for you to be completely financially independent? Yeah. Um, this was kind of a big thing in America. Uh, there's this movement called the FIRE movement, which stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. And so what that basically means is, you know, that you can have passive income. And how that was usually done is either through a business real estate, a certain amount of rentals, or index funds. And so the, the whole financial independence retire early or, or the whole FIRE movement was based on on this kind of old model, this what we now know as like a fiat model, or as a Bitcoiner, I know that that's what, that, that's what it is basically. It's just this, you're depending on monetary debasement and you're depending on the stocks going up over time at 8% a year. And you're, you're depending on a 4% safe withdrawal rate. And if you can basically get, we'll just say, $2 million in stocks, then you can live off of 4% of that, which is eight hundred, sorry, 80000 a year. And so as long as you can fund those expenses in perpetuity and your stocks keep going up 8% a year, which is really just the fleet of monetary, it's just the rate of monetary debasement, right? So, so that's kind of what it started as for me. Um, but Bitcoin has completely shifted that paradigm where I don't know if it even makes sense to be financially, you know, I don't even know how well Bitcoin works with it other, other than the money just maintains its value, ideally, right? So it's it's kind of hard to, to, exp to imagine and explain on a Bitcoin standard, but uh, one way to think about it is... You'll hear financial experts say that you should save 10 or 20% of your income, right? Uh, if you save 10% of your income and live off 90%, it's going to take you nine years to save up one year of money. So if you save 20% of your income and live off 80, it's going to take you four years. If you save 30% of your income, it's going to take you about uh, two years to save up your, your income. Well, two and a half, roughly, but... Anyway, it's, it's, it's really a heavy focus on savings rate. But with Bitcoin, I think it's just different because in theory, your money will maintain its purchasing power over time versus you're just buying stocks that go up and pay dividends and appreciate faster than you spend, if that makes sense. So there's, there's, kinda, there's two ways of looking at it. There's the Bitcoin side and there's the, the stocks and real estate side. And then there's this beautiful thing that we have right now with Bitcoin that we are so early. So we don't only have the thing that Bitcoin just appreciates with over time or does not depreciate over time because it's a good store of value, but also it gets adopted. So a lot of more people come into the game. We are now at like three, eight, nine percent adoption, depending on what number you're looking at. Yeah. Uh, but we are coming uh, when Bitcoin actually comes, this global reserve currency, this global reserve asset that everybody uses as money, as, as uh, most of us probably uh, imagine that it will be. Then we go from those small adoption rates to like uh, 50, 60, 80, 70, maybe even 100 percent adoption rate. So this is where like a huge upside potential actually is. So it's like a weird in uh, savings and investment pair where Bitcoin is the savings thing, but also an investment side of things because uh, it has such a huge amount of investment. It's a, it's, it's a weird thing to be in because it goes up uh, so quickly, but we are saying, oh, it's just a savings technology. <laughs> How do you look at it? Yeah, um, that's the thing is, is from 2009 to 2021, I was completely all about stocks. And even though I was reading about stocks at the time, all I did really was buy index funds, like the S&P 500. And so when I started learning about Bitcoin, I first got into it in 2017. And 
my, my uh, dad and my sister were, were interested in it and they were telling me about it. I read about Warren Buffett. I was like, well, he doesn't like it. I like Warren Buffett, so I, I don't like Bitcoin either. I'm just going to side with Warren Buffett. Eventually, I got some FOMO and I, I ended up getting some Ethereum, mostly. I thought I missed the boat on Bitcoin, so I, I went with Ethereum. I even mined it for uh, uh, probably six months. And, um, and you know, I'm, I quickly, like, I quadrupled the money I put in in December of 2017. I went from 2000 to 8000 And then six months after, this is the bottom of 2018, everything had taken a, a big dive. My $2,000 I originally put in was now $500. And I just sat on it. And then it kind of came back in two, two, uh, 2021. And at that point, I was like, maybe there's something here. So I ended up buying a course and learning about Bitcoin. And it took me about six months to, to really feel comfortable and to get it. But I, I ended up eventually selling my Ethereum for Bitcoin. I, I even borrowed against my house for Bitcoin. It, it just clicked for me. So it's, it's a little bit tough, you know, when we talk about being financially independent, because really Bitcoin, it's still in the 60s, 60,000 US dollars roughly or 63,000 today. And that's not far from when I got into it in 2021, uh, for what, three years ago, three years ago now. So, um, I'm hoping that the number continues to go up. Like you said, with the, we had, with the adoption to me, it's, it's an asymmetric bet, you know, because we are early. Um, but yeah, hopefully as the adoption goes up and I think as we see the money printers turn back on, I think we will see those those numbers continue to go up, but uh, anyway, it, it definitely it looks definitely different, different on a on a Bitcoin uh, standard on a hard money standard. I think uh, as far as being financially independent, it's it's really if you imagine living on a gold standard, uh, we'll just say two hundred years ago or something, and yeah, it, it is as simple as if you want to if you're going to work from age twenty to sixty for forty years. And you're going to live to be 90. And so you're going to retire from 60 to 90. Then, yeah, you, you essentially need to save a certain amount of money for those 30 years. But prices shouldn't go up necessarily. Prices might even go down as things improve, as technology improves. So in theory, over your working career, you, you might be fine saving you know, 10 15% of your money. Um, but I do think Bitcoin makes you more frugal over time. So anyway, I know I'm kind of going off on a rant there, but let me know what you want to touch on with that. Yeah, it, it definitely makes me more frugal and I want to get into uh, financial frugality also a little bit later. Um, but before uh, we go there, I would love to dive into what you said, where you got Ethereum, then you also got Bitcoin and then you switched actually to Bitcoin only as i understood it and you even like borrowed against your house um what made you do that like what what uh, was was there something that clicked for you that like oh bitcoin actually has value from uh, and i can relate to that a lot because i was also a warren buffett <laughs> kind, a child and was learning a lot about him and how to invest in stocks and stuff like that and how to pick stocks and i did a lot of stocks picking even uh, before I get on, got onto Bitcoin, but what made it click for you to be then um, primarily focused on Bitcoin? Um, what, what made sense to me over time with Bitcoin is understanding Metcalf models and just the value of a network. And I know Facebook is kind of an example. Their stock price uh, tends to kind of mirror. It's a Metcalf model. It's, it's a the size of the network makes the company more valuable that the amount of users they have directly influences the amount of uh, value the stock has had over time. So, so you can, you can see this in multiple different areas. I don't have any great examples off offhand, but Metcalf models made sense to me and Bit Bitcoin being a network, it made sense to me that the value should increase over time just off of that. But uh, what, what made a lot of sense to me, is that it's a feature that Satoshi is not around, that the founder of Bitcoin is not around, that it's a asset without an issuer. It's truly decentralized. Everything, every other cryptocurrency is, is trading that decentralization for speed and some other stuff um, that may or may not be useful. 
but uh, really what I'm most interested in is separation of money from state and and just savings technology. So to me, that's kind of what Bitcoin is. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to explain to a new person. Uh, I feel like there's so many things that you have to kind of set the record straight on that inflation is bad, that inflation is theft, you know, because we're told and, and most people kind of have this idea that a little inflation is good because it encourages, it, it encourages the growth of the economy because you want to spend before your money goes down in value to even just two or 3%. So you might as well spend today, but Bitcoin kind of flips that and says, you know, you should save your money because in the future it's going to be cheaper. So I, I like that. Um, I'm not like an environmentalist uh, climate change type of guy, but but I do, some of that appeals to me in the fact of I, I hate waste. I hate wasting stuff. I hate throwing away something that I could fix or that I could, you know, basically find another purpose for. So like I'll see, I'll see people leave stuff on the curb on garbage day that still has life in it, and I'll go pick it up, and I'll I'll, I'll use it until it's truly used up, or I'll I'll fix it up so that it can be used for a long time, you know. But I I really uh, Bitcoin has kind of made me more frugal. I've already had that tendency in my life, but yeah, I just hate waste. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry, that's a random thing there. But barring gets my, against my oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I just want to quickly jump in and say like uh, Bitcoin uh, and sound money in general, like hard money uh, versus soft money as we have with the fiat standard, it incentivizes to be more um, careful with our environment, careful with our uh, nature also. So Bitcoin, when it actually uh, presses sound money onto the world, uh, with that, the nature and the environment uh, and all those uh, environmental activists will actually benefit from Bitcoin because it brings that um, uh, care for things back and fiat because money is so cheap and it incentivizes a high time preference and uh, high consumerism uh, actually is against uh, the environmental list. So this is kind of like my, my view on this and I just want to quickly add to this, but uh, go ahead. No, I mean, it, it's true. And it, and it was something, this is just a random thing, but it blows my mind that it's worth it to go dig up oil and get it out of the ground and ship it around the world and process it and turn it into a plastic cup that you use once and throw in the trash. You know, it, it blows my mind that that is economically profitable and feasible, but it is uh, because we have low time preference or, or, or high time preference. You know, we're, we're all about consumerism. So yes, infinite money and consumerism does go against the environment. Um, people will say that Bitcoin wastes energy, but we waste a lot of energy with these with these high time preference activities and not being willing to put in the work to you know even just do dishes and stuff. But uh, yeah, if it's if it becomes if stuff like that becomes disincentivized uh, over time, then you know I think Bitcoin can disincentivize a lot of this consumerism stuff and just the throwaway culture. So anyway. You also wanted to say something with uh, borrowing it uh, against the house uh, where I cut you off. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, you, you know, you asked about that, and I would not recommend someone do that. But when it made sense to me, it, it, it just clicked, and I kind of felt this sense of urgency that I was behind. And I will say this. At the time, Plan B was this big thing on Twitter in 2021, and basically... I remember in 2021, we were we were expecting Bitcoin to be like in the 80,000 range in November of 2021, and then like eventually into the the six figures. And of course, we never got there. Uh, FTX, Voyager, Celsius, all that happened, and uh, I narrowly escaped uh, those brokerages going down uh, by getting into self custody. But but yeah, I'm not really sure why the price didn't do what we thought it was. I think a lot of it had to do with paper Bitcoin. Uh, basically, people were buying, obviously, on FTX, Bitcoin that was not there, and different exchanges like that. Um, but yeah, I uh, I basically felt like I was about to miss the bus and that Bitcoin could go parabolic. And so we, we did borrow it against the house, and then we lost like 70% of it. We almost lost it all on Celsius, but I, I self-custodied the money. 
and uh, you know, I got a hardware wallet, took it off exchange, and I was safe. And then it came back, and obviously we're we're in the green again, not by a lot, but I've dollar cost average the whole time. But yeah, I just had conviction. The other thing is, if if, if we were a single income household, I would not have borrowed against my house. But we were a dual income household. You know, we're we're very we're very frugal, as I said. We live on about fifty percent of our income, and then we save and invest the other fifty percent. And so, if I was not in that position, I would not recommend borrowing against my house. But I, I felt like it was a calculated risk. We could live off of one income if we had to, and we're just uh, paying off the debt with the other income, if that makes sense. Were you always a frugal, or is this something that developed over time? It's it's always I've always been that way, um, and kind of just been thrifty. Um, I've always driven old vehicles, uh, much older than a lot of people still. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, it's just the way that my mind works. That makes sense. Um, part of it is, uh, I'll share this. It's, it might be a little bit strange, but, um, there's a pioneer saying, I don't know if I'm going to get it right, but it's, it's like, make it do, do without, you might have to edit this, but it's it's something that I, I heard that has stuck with me uh, forever. And it's, it's, let's see, it says, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. And that's something I heard as a, as a young child. And it's stuck with me, you know, throughout, throughout the years. That's amazing. Uh, I loved it. I loved it a lot. Uh, I don't even like. I heard it. I feel like before somehow, uh, but I never uh, connected with, with that. Uh, it's it's really beautiful. I, I love it. Um, and a lot of I feel like it comes from the fiat world. Uh, but I also af often ask myself, maybe it is because it's human nature to spend money. Like you have something and you want to kind of spend it now uh and you like you only live once what if you die next year and stuff like that does it really matter to to save up a lot of money like um is there a case to be made like outside of being financially independent in the future uh that you should be financially frugal is, is there like something that uh, even gives you I mean, you when you always were like that, uh, you, maybe it's it's hard for you to to talk about that. But uh, is there something that even gives you something now, being frugal, uh, and even like is something good about being minimalistic or frugal frugalistic uh, even now? Yeah, that that's a tough one. Um, even even my dad, when he got me interested in stocks, and he, you know, I got so obsessed with stocks and investing. And I've always saved basically 50% of my income um, since college. And even in college, I worked and, and I was able to save a lot of money. Um, I had some high-paying sales jobs in college, uh, doing summer sales door-to-door. -door. And uh, my dad would always say, make sure you have fun now. And I, you know, I didn't really do a good job following that. I, I really delayed gratification for years. For, for example, I used to race dirt bikes. And I loved that as a teenager. Um, I gave up dirt bikes for college. I mean, in college, I could have rode. I had the money to ride, um, but I chose not to because it was expensive. Parts are expensive. Dirt bikes are expensive. The maintenance of them and, and the gear and everything. And uh, even though I, I've always had enough money to ride dirt bikes, I, I chose to give up my favorite hobby. And I, I kind of, I still watch the pros. I read You know, I read about the pros and I, I follow the series, the professional series closely, but um, I'm actually just barely getting back into it after basically 12 or 13 years off of dirt bikes. And uh, it's it's a little bit tough, actually. I'm I'm spending thousands of dollars on motorcycles and getting gear again and getting my, my kids into it. Um, and part of it, The, why I want to now is is I have built that base because I took a decade of saving half my income and investing that money into stocks, Bitcoin, and real estate. And so I've, I've got a really good base compared to most people, actually any age group in America. I'm, I'm doing quite well on a comparative basis. But um, but yeah, it's because I, I sacrificed it for a decade or more. And uh, 
it's part of me wishes that I had done that stuff still and that I had more fun because it's hard getting back into it a little bit older. But anyway, that's uh, not everyone's is wired that way, but I'm definitely the type that is willing and able to delay gratification, but I'm, I'm actually forcing myself to spend money now a little bit more. And I feel like it's also like an age thing. Uh, and I feel like when you're young, there is the time where you should actually discipline yourself as much as you can uh, to be more like there's a lot of studies on that. Like there's uh, scientific proof on that. Uh, people that, especially when they have like kids or like, even young people uh, that are able to delay the gratification, uh, they are way more successful in later in life because they are willing to dive into mud a little bit now to have something bigger tomorrow. Definitely, like if this yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and this is like not even. Not even if you are conservative and you just like uh, have a normal job and you like want to uh, have like 20% or 50% savings rate. Uh, but even like if you want to build a business, sometimes you have to like really ha uh, have a hard time uh, growing something and building something out. And then uh, maybe you can see the, the, the re rewards of that in like five, 10 years. And maybe you never see it because it does not work out. But that delayed gratification allows you to uh, accept a lower pay, uh, to accept like uh, a second job next to your business and something like that. So there's a lot to um, delayed gratification, even beyond just being frugal and, and saving money, I, I feel like. Um, is that something you, you think people can learn? Is like being frugal something that you, you could imagine teaching? <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, and, and kind of what you're talking about. Maybe you, maybe you're familiar with this. It's it's something called the marshmallow test. It's a test that they did on kids, um, where they basically set a kid in a room, and they don't know they're being filmed, but they you, you put a marshmallow on a plate and say, if you can wait 15 minutes, then I'll give you another marshmallow, or you can just eat the one right in front of you now. And the kids that waited and got two marshmallows at the end of 15 minutes. Those are the, those kids actually went on to be a lot more successful. Uh, they had less problems with like addictions as they grew up. You know, these, these are like five or six year olds, right. That they're testing and, and researching. But, uh, you know, there, there's uh, other factors of that test as well, but, um, I've actually done that to my own kids and we'll, we'll have them do the marshmallow test and see if they can last 15 minutes alone with the marshmallow so they can get that second one. Um, but, but yeah, I'm trying to teach my kids that. And the other thing, and is, the other thing is that about delayed gratification is saving for your future should be gratifying. And for some reason, people don't think it is. But I love when I get paid and I shave off half that paycheck and I put it, I might put it into stocks or real estate or Bitcoin, more likely nowadays. Um, but, but that's gratifying to me, that, that buying of Bitcoin And, and, uh, yeah, that should be, it should be gratifying today to save for your future. In my opinion, it's like paying yourself first. Like when, I, whenever I feel like it, um, you have, uh, like bills coming, the electric bill is to do, maybe you have to pay rent. Maybe you have to pay for groceries, whatever you have to pay, like your, for your daily life, you always pay someone else, the supermarket, the the landlord, something like that. Um, for savings, if you save in Bitcoin, like 10% of your income goes uh, directly to Bitcoin, um, this is paying yourself, like your future self. And uh, I'm always a really a big believer in paying yourself actually first. That's what I do since yeah, years. I don't even remember when I started, probably like five, six years ago, or maybe in like six, seven years ago. I'm pretty young with 25 now. Um, but it's, it's, it's fascinating, uh, for me what it does, because whenever I get a paycheck, uh, and, and now I get multiples uh, throughout the month, whenever something comes in, the amount that I don't need about that uh, money. And I know because I'm doing a strict project thing, uh, and know exactly what I need. I, it goes directly into Bitcoin. I like, I pay myself first, I pay myself first in Bitcoin 
and then afterwards the electric bill comes uh, uh, this bill comes this bill comes uh, and this is something really beautiful and extremely gratifying for me but i feel like i'm <laughs> i'm special in that regard uh, and you're also probably special in that regard i feel like most of my outside bitcoin friend outside this financial bubble uh world uh, when i talk with with let's say normies with like just random friends um they don't always see it like that uh most of them don't see it like that so where i'm i'm thinking i'm going with with the next question is like when we have switching now from a soft money to a hard money from like fiat money to bitcoin could that actually change also society could that actually like bring this low time preference uh to everybody uh and or not everybody but make it mainstream to be frugal i think it definitely could um it has the potential to because uh, again if you it's like warren not warren buffett but charlie munger he says show me the incentive and i'll show you the outcome and so if people notice that shift over time uh but we're, we're still so early i mean there was someone at the ohio state university maybe you saw the clip but that they mentioned bitcoin in a commencement address at the end of a, a college semester and they got booed and laughed at for mentioning Bitcoin. So, you know, we're still very early, but I think um, if Bitcoin continues to do what we expect uh, and go up in price, and really it's, I don't even see it as Bitcoin going up. I see Bit, I, I largely see it as the dollar going down in value over time. But obviously Bitcoin should accrue that value because we are early. It's an asymmetric bet. And uh, the, the amount of users adoption over time should have it actually outperform the monetary debasement over time, I think. But, but yeah, it could definitely, I think, shift to a more frugal, even more like a minimalistic society. Um, yeah, I, I could totally see that happening. And I, I feel like when when a lot of people ask, "Oh, I made like five percent in the stock market or ten percent in the stock market." What they often don't realize that they didn't made 5% or 10% in the stock market. Uh, they, uh, just fell down with their debasement. Like they, they calculate in a currency that is debased so fast that the mountain is not growing. They're falling off the cliff and the mountain is <laughs> like rising next to them because they're falling down, uh, to, to the bottom. Uh, and it's kind of this, this picture where, you are benefiting from Bitcoin um, uh, when when you get it and when you actually uh, calculate in it. And for me, I'm trying to make this mind switch. Whenever I do something, I'm trying to think of um, what does this cost in in Bitcoin, especially with big things. Obviously, it's hard to do it with s small things. But uh, if if I really want to maybe invest in this stock that I'm really passionate about, does it really outperform bitcoin in the next 10 years probably not it's really like even if it's outperforms it it does not outperform it by a large margin and why should i invest in it now like it has to be really freaking good like it has to be one of the best stocks in the stock market to outperform bitcoin over the next 10 years because we also have this adoption rate uh, of bitcoin so why should i invest in it or uh, what should i invest outside of my Bitcoin. And the only thing that I can think of is my own company that I'm starting now with content producing and, and a lot more things coming in the next few months. But this is the only thing where I'm like, okay, I, I'm willing to invest in, in my own company, in my own um, abilities, in my own knowledge. This is like the only investment I feel like I'm now comfortable doing outside of Bitcoin. Everything else is, is basically <laughs> Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of on the same page. Um, we, you talked about how when you buy stocks and stocks go up 5%, you know, a lot of times that's almost in conjunction with how much new money is printed. And uh, you'll see these charts shared by Bitcoiners and charts that I had not seen before when I was in the FIRE movement. Uh, but but it, it really shows how the amount of money in circulation directly ties to the stock market indexes and it's it's just a great way of treading water like stocks are a pretty good inflation hedge it appears but 
yeah, you're not really getting ahead unless you're like me. Maybe if you save 50% of your income and you use that money to tread water and you earn some dividends, yeah, maybe it feels like you're getting ahead and, and maybe you picked a few individual stocks that might be winners that get you a little bit ahead. But yeah, I, it's, it's ruined stock investing for me because a lot of stocks in an index I don't want to own because they make processed foods and junky products. And so it's, it's really a struggle for me. A lot of my stock investments that are not easy, you know, I have to pay tax and penalty to get rid of. So I'm mostly switched them all away from index funds into spot Bitcoin ETFs. I know that's kind of controversial as a Bitcoiner, I should hold it in self custody, but it's just not easy for me to take a 10% tax haircut and a 10% you know, penalty haircut on that and, and buy 80% of the Bitcoin when I could pay a small fee for a little bit. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out what to do with that stuff. But yeah, I've got that and micro strategy obviously is kind of like a you know a, a good Bitcoin play, a leveraged Bitcoin play in a way with a profitable uh, software business on top. So it's, it's stock market is really tough for me right now uh, to, to know what to do and to justify. Um, now that I understand Bitcoin, I'm with you on the business. My wife owns her business and I'm definitely all about helping her grow that business um, and potentially starting my own business one day. Other than that, I'm just focused on increasing my income and saving in Bitcoin. And uh, I guess in a way kind of getting, rid of debt that I don't need, which all I have is my mortgage at this point. So yeah, it's a, it's a tricky situation with now with stocks for me. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy bitcoin it's simple have a bitcoin only exchange don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that be on a bitcoin only exchange i use 21 bitcoin 21 bitcoin is for me the best partner for that and now where do you store bitcoin bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet so that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. And I hope that stocks get more interesting in the future again, because I love the time when I picked stocks. Um, I really loved it. And I, I had even great gainers in there and it was fun to stay up till one, two in the morning to, to watch the, the conference, co conference calls uh, because they were all in America and, and I was in Europe. Uh, so this was a fun time, honestly, and it got me into investing. And I hope this time comes back when investing is not about preserving uh, the financial energy but actually investing in businesses you believe and you actually gain something from that and you can uh, um, yeah, support the businesses that you think uh, will change the future. Uh, this is for me what investing is and not like, oh, I don't know what to do with my money and I just put it all in an uh, ETF so uh, I, I don't lose it all and I can keep up with inflation. That is kind of like misusing uh, the investing side of things. Uh, I, I feel like so Bitcoin is like savings and then investing is completely something uh, different, which also leads me to my the next question. Um, what what would you say does Bitcoin success look like when you go ahead and, and think like 10, 50, maybe even like 100 years into the future uh, and, and, and uh, it, you look back at, at the Bitcoin history? Um, 
how, when do we know Bitcoin actually succeeded? Is it the global reserve currency status? Is it uh, that fiat is not no longer around? Is it that Bitcoin reached a certain massive market capitalization in a fiat denominated currency? Or like, how do you see uh, the success of Bitcoin when you look back in, in maybe like 50 years? That's a tough one. It's hard for me to say um, if we'll always have government issued currency side by side with Bitcoin. If we eventually get to where every business is a Bitcoin company or, or like basically accepts Bitcoin. Uh, that That's a really hard question for me to even guess on or envision. There's a lot smarter people than me, but really... You know, and, and what, what, one way I pitch Bitcoin to people, though, is is just like if you're if you have a prepper tendency, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with preppers, it's kind of an American thing. Maybe it's in Europe, too, but people will get like bunkers and they'll get food storage and they'll get bullets and, and guns and, and coins and physical cash. And just like if if things go bad, you know, they, they've got a garden, they've got uh, chickens and stuff and, and they've got like supplies like they could live kind of in a broken down society. And I, I think Bitcoin is one of those tools that you could use in a broken down society like that. But um, I, I don't really know what it looks like or what I should, what it should look like. What, what I can say is that in my mind, it will always go up. Like people will get mad at Bitcoin because it's volatile and it goes up and down. But that's, when you when you have something that's fixed in supply like bitcoin being measured against something that is always changing in supply with like the dollars and every other currency in the world the yen um pesos whatever whatever currency you want like it's always going to change because everything else is changing around it so they the thing is they're so indebted most countries they're going to print more money they're going to monetize their debt it's it's always going to go up it's always going to be volatile too because of these factors because some some countries might tighten their money supply at one point or another some countries might ease their money supply at one point or another so it's it's uh it's tough obviously there's narratives in bitcoin there's sentiment there's whales there's traders there's leverage people play different games it's the same with the stock market you've got long term holders short term holders uh people that are selling options and and puts and stuff like that that I don't fully understand. There's swing and momentum traders. People play different games in the stocks, similar to how they play different games with currencies and Bitcoin. So what does it look like? I would love to be able to spend Bitcoin on a daily basis. Um, even my wife's business, I think, is set up to take Bitcoin, but they have not advertised that. No one has done it because no one knows about it. And even if people knew they took Bitcoin, 99% of people don't have any or wouldn't even know how to spend it. So I don't, I don't know what it looks like um, in 10 years other than I, I hope, I mean, even 10 years out, but I hope that it continues to, to uh, basically protect against the debasement. And I would love to see more merchant adoption. There's a few merchants near me and there there's apps that will have the maps showing places that take Bitcoin. But yeah, I'd love to see it be, used as a medium of exchange a bit more, I think that will help its use case. And I think maybe even Square is moving that way because now with with Square, like anyone at the farmer's market can convert some of their earnings to Bitcoin. And it you know it's owned by Jack Dorsey, so it may not be long before they're accepting Bitcoin as an option of, for payment to every everyone that uses Square, which is a lot of businesses. So yeah, that's, that's really what I'm hoping for, but uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to say 100 years out. Um, other than I hope that it kind of, you know, I've got three kids and one on the way. And I just look at America and I, I think like, what's it going to look like for them in 10 years when my, my oldest is 18 and college costs $400,000 for an undergraduate degree. The average American house doesn't cost 400000 anymore. Now it costs $1.2 million. And right now, I think the median household income in America is seventy-five thousand or so, eighty thousand, and maybe it's one hundred twenty thousand. But but still, like I just don't know how she's going to ever buy a house. I don't know how. 
it's going to look and uh, it's, it's a scary world. So that's really what I care about the most is how does it look in the next probably 10 to 20 years is, is what I'm focused on. Cause um, I plan on helping my kids. I save Bitcoin for my kids. So I, I went off on a few tangents there, but it's, it's hard to say. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's, it's, um, I'm, I mean, I mean, my hope is that Bitcoin makes housing affordable, uh, when you save, uh, in Bitcoin and when you have your unit of account in Bitcoin, uh, I mean, we already have seen that in the past 10, 15 years where when you calculate the house price in US dollars, all of a sudden everything goes up and up and up. When you calculate it in Bitcoin, every year it gets cheaper and cheaper because of course Bitcoin gets adopted and Bitcoin appreciates in value uh, long term. Uh, and when more and more people adopt Bitcoin, all of a sudden the, the narrative changes and they're like, oh, if I adopt Bitcoin, housing get a, uh, is getting affordable. If everybody adopts Bitcoin, housing is getting affordable for everybody. Maybe not in 10 years, maybe 10 years a little bit um, too early for that. Um, but uh, definitely if you save in Bitcoin for your kids, especially, they will be able to to buy multiple houses probably with uh, those Bitcoins uh, because uh, you saved in uh, really sound money uh, really early on and they can have the fruits of that uh, wisdom of, of, of yours, if, if I <laughs> can say, say it like that. Um, which also brings me to an interesting uh, conversation because you mentioned it, the future of education. I mean, in Europe, when you go to college, it does not cost anything. Like, I don't, maybe in some areas, but in Austria, for example, you don't spend any dollars uh, for education here. Like you go to university, uh, you have to pay small fees. This is like under 100 euros per, per semester. Uh, if you have, if you take longer than normal, uh, you have to pay like a fine for like 300 or 400 euros per semester. It's basically nothing compared to that what in America universities cost, uh, which I think is also resulting in higher quality universities in America because uh, there is more money in there, uh, of course. Uh, uh, but in general, even in Austria, more and more people are opting out of that traditional university and education system and more like okay let's let's get to work and uh, if i want to educate myself in something uh, i can find that in a more decentralized way there's also like michael saylor who wants to do like online uh university where uh, how is it called uh, saylor academy or something like that yeah um yeah. Uh, where he even puts like mit classes on there so like where do you see this 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 future of of, of education with the internet and uh, like this kind of more modern uh, media and and where people like and kids can get educated in a more decentralized uh, way? Uh, yeah, I mean that's a tough one for me. It's it's hard for me to to think about. Um, I, I do I do um, know some private schools um, where it's still possible. There's there's places you can go. Um, I know there's a, a college where every, the, the college, um, campus is ran and maintained by students. So all the janitorial, all of the landscaping. So every, every student on campus has a job and they help maintain everything so that, uh, the cost of tuition is cheaper. So I know there's places that you can get a good education, get your undergraduate, uh, for your degree. Uh, for, for probably in the 40 to 50 K range for, you know, that's not too bad about 10,000 a year, 12,000 a year. Um, so I know that there's ways of doing it, but, uh, I, you know, in America we have these 529 accounts that are tax, uh, tax deductible. They, they save you money on taxes, uh, and they, they have to go towards education, but I've, I've, uh, I've actually foregone those. I do, I do do a, uh, Sorry, I use a custodial brokerage account actually for my kids, and I'm a little bit torn on this. But uh, I'm just putting in 600 bucks a year, about 50 bucks a month for each kid, uh, and that's that's what I'm doing for them. Uh, other than that, I'm just saving in Bitcoin for my kids. Um, so that's that's really my strategy: is the custodial accounts. Depending on how old my kid is, that 600 dollars a year is gonna you know, if the stock market does, it's 8% on average 
and basically treads water with inflation. It's going to be something there for them. It's going to have a, a decent little base to hopefully pay a year or two of college. And the cool thing about who I use, it's it's a it's an app called Early Bird. And grandparents can can contribute, aunts and uncles can contribute. Um, you can you also add moments. You you add these pictures and and videos and memories. You can leave them messages and advice. And so it's kind of like this uh, memory and money custodial brokerage vault. Uh, so so anyway, it's kind of cool. But like my oldest has about fifteen hundred dollars in her account. And projected value at 18 using average stock returns is about $12,000. You know, my next youngest kid started younger, and so he, and he has longer to go. It's going to be about $15,000, and my youngest should get about $21,000 based on just historical stock returns. And anyway, that's, uh, that's what I do for them. It, it, with, with the custodial brokers, they can use that money to buy a house. They can use it to buy real estate, start a business. Um, to travel the world, to, to, you know, they could use it for anything they want, really, uh, to buy a car. So it's a lot more flexible. It doesn't really have the tax advantage for either one of us, but it is a way to give them flexibility. So that's what I'm using is a custodial brokerage in conjunction with Bitcoin. So yeah, that's, that's how I look at it. Um, and then part of me thinks that, uh, you know, kids do so many extracurriculars these days that parents are just shuttling them around. I'd love if my kids uh, maybe did less extracurriculars and actually had jobs in high school is kind of my hope. And even jobs working for my wife's business, if they can, in some capacity, um, actually building skills, potentially trying to get them to do apprenticeships on trades uh, so that they always have something that, to fall back on or a side hustle. Like, if, if my kids could know a side hustle of uh, of doing carpentry work or something like that, I think that's always valuable. They could, again, they could buy used furniture, fix and flip it. But yeah, basically, I'm just trying to find any avenue for my kids to build real marketable skills before they even go to college. And if they end up getting a white-collar job and being a programmer or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it is, that's great. But they also need to have... A hard skill, in my opinion. And it's so important to uh, teach them that. And uh, I'm really passionate about that. I myself uh, started working even in school already, like before uh, going to university. Uh, I had like a school that was like uh, eight, 38, 39, 40 hours a week, plus homework, plus preparation for uh, exams and stuff like that. And on top of that, I worked between five to 10 hours a week. Uh, and all the, uh, all the money that I made, because I was still living in my parents' house, obviously, uh, I directly invested, like I had a savings rate basically of 100% because my parents paid for my um, uh, living situation and I worked. So I had everything. Like I, I say, I basically saved in total euros amounts, probably more than the average Austrian with like 17, 18 years old, uh, because, uh, I just saved everything. I did not buy anything with it. I did not go on parties on with that anything. And that's how I actually got ahead really early on, uh, because I invested in, uh, researched a lot, got also in Bitcoin quite early. Uh, so like, uh, this, 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 I only had this opportunity because I had money. Uh, when I did not have the job, I probably would have not gone into investing because <laughs> I did not have any, any money to distribute. So if you don't have any money to save, uh, you don't look into savings. Uh, and that's, that's why I'm really passionate about, uh, getting, uh, getting kids as soon as possible, at least a small side job. It doesn't have to be like a, 30 hour job or something like that, but like five, 10, maybe 15 hours, depending on how much they do. Uh, that's, that's great for them to learn, uh, like a hard skill, uh, how, and to learn like what, what is the world outside of school? Like what is the actual world like where, uh, outside of school where people actually work? Uh, that's, that's a, a really cool thing that you're trying also to, to do that. Yeah. Even as, even just, uh, mowing the lawn, um, my my five year old and my eight year old actually mowed the lawn part of it for the first time this last week, and 
Uh, I don't expect them to do the whole yard, but I try to give them a section to do. And, and I tell them like, at some point you're going to do this whole thing. <laughs> and if you want to make money, you could actually go to a neighbor and probably make $30. You know, that's enough money to go to the arcade twice. And so that's kind of their, their, you know, they perked up when they heard that, like, oh, I could go to the arcade twice and, and play games and stuff if I work hard for one hour and mow a lawn. You know, so that, that kind of gets them thinking, even at a young age, what they can do. Um, you know, and my it's tough because my oldest, she wants to be an artist. And, you know, I don't even try to plant ideas in their head of what to be when what they could be when they grow up. I do try to point out interesting jobs. Like whenever I see a uh, a person working on a power line after a storm, and I point out jobs like that, you know, just things that they would not even think about. Uh, there, there's a lot of different types of jobs that are not advertised uh, that, that can be lucrative, that can be technical, that can be fun and challenging. Um, but my oldest wants to be an artist. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Mark Rober, um, a YouTube guy, YouTube guy. but he's, no, got, uh, he's got this thing called Crunch Labs and he teaches these kids engineering things and uh, they, they build these, these little, uh, they basically build their own toys. Um, that, you know, it's like a trip wire that shoots, uh, these little foam balls at you. If you, if you trip over the, the string or it's a, it's a disc launcher. And there was one that was recently art focused. So I'm trying to get my, my daughter, who's very interested in art. She wants to sell paintings. I'm trying to show her that you can do art in different ways. Um, and I'd like to buy a 3d printer and like a laser etcher and and see like hey look you can do art with a laser you can do art with a 3d printer you can make something beautiful that people will buy or or something useful you can engineer and design a useful product that has you know artsy elements to it so i'm i'm trying to to leverage the interest in art to you know tie it into something more engineering focused so that they can make something cool but uh it, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting challenge that I'm working on. I love it. I love how you how do, how you approach this this topic. And uh, before we get to our end routine of the podcast, and before we get to the end of the podcast, um, I'm trying to ask all my my guests what are they currently really passionate about outside of Bitcoin and uh, frugality and what we all touched on the in this podcast episode. Is there anything that you're really passionate about? Uh, in in your life, in in what you're maybe currently learning or uh, currently pursuing, that we did not touch on uh, till now. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on three things. Um, one thing that I'm really interested in that I mentioned is is dirt bikes that I gave up for so long. Um, I follow the pro dirt bike racers. One thing that's really cool about racing a dirt bike is that at the professional level. It's very accessible. Uh, most motorsports, car racing, whether it's IndyCar, F1, Joe Schmo off the street cannot, they will never have a chance to, to do any sort of motorsport like that. But one thing I like about dirt bike racers is you've got the professionals that are sponsored by factory teams racing against um, a guy that uh, builds houses during the week and he shows up, but he's a, he's a good rider and he can buy a, a dirt bike and he can race it on the weekend. And, uh, dirt bikes are getting more and more expensive. I've actually, uh, charted out the price of a dirt bike in, in dollars and in Bitcoin. And so it's, it's, uh, something I'm trying to, there was actually, uh, an exchange that sponsored American supercross last year called SmartFi. They were kind of a Celsius Celsius like they had their own token and they had loans and stuff. And I don't know if they're still kicking or not, but I, I found it was interesting um, that at least it kind of got crypto a little bit, maybe Bitcoin in front of people. Uh, although, you know, most cryptos I would say are scams, but I do have this passion for trying to show people that ride dirt bikes and an expensive hobby that Bitcoin can help them, that uh, these weekend warriors that work a normal job, but that can still go make a professional main event on the weekend that Bitcoin can make their lives easier. If they save in Bitcoin, if they, if they uh, are able to kind of build up a cushion 
and over time save money in Bitcoin. So that's that's one thing I'm passionate about. Um, the other thing that Bitcoin has kind of done for me is it's given me a much bigger interest in my health. And I've, I've completely changed my diet, um, and not only just for me, but for my kids, but getting them off of Cheez-Its and, and processed foods and snacks like that and into other things, um, even if it's just jerky, you know, there's, it's still going to be processed to some degree. My kids are unfortunately kind of used to, you know, some of those fiat foods, you could say, but there are some brands that don't have seed oils that don't have as many preservatives. And so we've been shifting the cereals that they eat away from cereals into more eggs and homemade sourdough toast and stuff like that. Uh, instead of bread that has all this garbage in it. So I'm also just learning to cook. I've never cooked anything pretty much until this year. And because of Bitcoin, I've, I've got this huge interest in cooking, which is uh, great for not just only our health, but it's also great for my wife <laughs> and taking that load off of her a little bit more. So uh, finally, we, we talked about this with frugality a little bit, but I wanted to mention this concept that I don't think a lot of people have heard of. They might um, intuitively know about it, but it's this concept that is, it's vital to my frugality. It's vital to my understanding of life. It's called hedonic adaptation. Have you, have you heard of that? You familiar with that term? Uh, no. Okay. So maybe uh, some people might hear it more in association with, in association with uh, the hedonic treadmill, which is kind of the idea of keeping up with the Joneses that, your neighbor gets the new car, and so you get the new car, and you get you make more money in your career, and so you upgrade your house. You kind of upgrade your lifestyle. You got this lifestyle inflation, this lifestyle creep over time where you just want more and more and more. Um, but hedonic adaptation kind of flips it on its head, and it, it's just a study of happiness. There was a, a study on happiness conducted, and it's been replicated many times. But what it found is they had people rate their happiness over time. And some of the people in the study won the lottery. And the other people in the study actually got paralyzed from the waist down. And so they studied these people. Like, I'm just saying, I'm an active person. I ride bikes. I run. I work out. I, I do all these things with my kids. You know, I'm the parent that's actually not sitting on the bench on my phone at the playground, but I'm actually playing with my kids. If I lost my ability to walk, I'd be pretty devastated, I think. What they found in studying people is that when they were paralyzed, you know, their happiness was kind of at a certain level before, and then it went way down. But within six months after their accident of being paralyzed, they go back to their baseline level of happiness that they had before the accident. So basically, you can still be happy. When you're paralyzed, when you have this big life tragedy, you're going to go back to this. Everyone kind of has a baseline level of happiness. You're going to go right back to it within six months or less. Same thing for the lottery winners. You think it's like this huge thing. Life is just going to be great. You've got millions of dollars in the bank now. Not so. You're going to have a spike in happiness, and then you're going to go right back to the same level of happiness that you had before. And so what that teaches me is that you can choose to adapt upwards or downwards. Either way, you're going to be about the same level of happiness. And so I can downgrade my car. Like if you were driving a Tesla and you downgraded to my car, which is a six, uh, $600 uh, junky old Chevy, uh, you're going to be bummed because it's not fast. It's not as comfortable. Uh, the door is kind of janky. It's hard to close. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it, it doesn't even have um, a USB port that you can plug in your phone and listen to music. You have to use the radio still. You're going to be bummed downgrading your car. But within six months, you won't even care. Your, your, ha your happiness level is going to be the same because you just get used to things up or down. So I, uh, I t intentionally choose to challenge myself and to downgrade my lifestyle at times. And not just upgrade it because I know I'll still be happy over the long term. So that's a that's a powerful concept that people can experiment with. You can downgrade your life and it might suck at first, but 
eventually you'll you'll go back to the same level of happiness as you had before. And it's uh, it's an amazing insight, honestly. And uh, I can just uh, add one personal note in there. Uh, I because I made some some gains in in the stock market, I made a mistake and bought a Tesla <laughs> because I mentioned it. Uh, yeah. And what yeah. I what I found was exactly that with six months. Uh, it was amazing to drive this thing the first one, two months. Uh, it was really cool. The first month, it was amazing for me. And in the second two, three months, it was amazing because I could uh, um, show it to my friends and it was like nice to share this kind of experience. Uh, and then after like four or five months and probably right around the six month period, it's it just gets normal. Like you get used to that. Uh, and then I decided, eh, it's actually not worth it. Like the extra money that it costs and the extra money you have to put in there, it's it's just not worth it because it does not give you uh, the happiness long term. I mean, if if you are having a lot of money and you have a great business, uh, there's nothing wrong with expensive cars if you can afford it and stuff like that. Like you enjoy your life, uh, but if like it it does not change anything like happiness does not come from money it might make things easier <laughs> if you have a lot of money but it does not come from money yeah that that's that's the main point for me and i use cars as, a, as an example but you know i've also downgraded my life at one point um uh, where we lived in a nice house five bedroom three bath bigger than we needed great place right next to a park you know we moved across the country for a job and downgraded to a two bedroom apartment and uh with a lady that would you know hit the broom on the ceiling when my kids were too loud so uh we were still happy and then we ended up in a condo and now we're back in a house so we we downgraded so that we could upgrade later uh we did it knowing and it, it's just easier to do if you need to get a goal done if you need to get a business off the ground like we talked about earlier to that to, to delay that gratification, but just to know that you'll still be happy. It's going to be hard sometimes at first, but you just get used to it. Like you said, up or down, you get used to it. Amazing. Yeah. It's uh, great insights that uh, you're sharing today with us. Um, we're coming to the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and the question for you is, and it's an interesting one and you can take it uh, or interpret it however you, you want to do it. Um, what value do you find in what you are doing? Okay. What value do I find in what I'm doing? My, is that in any aspect of life? I mean, uh, I try to not limit the, the question and also not limit the answer. So like you, you can interpret it, uh, as however you you want to take it, like take it in the dis direction that you feel comfortable in. Sure. Um, okay. What what I would start with is that uh, there's this quote that comes to mind that says, "No, I'm probably going to butcher it, but it says no success in life will compensate for failure in the home." So the the biggest value that I can bring in my life is to my wife and kids. And to basically teach my kids the right principles and let them make their own choices and set the, set an example for them and try to prepare them for life. That is my my number one priority. My number one focus in life is to provide, not just provide the, the needs of life for my family, but to provide a framework and, and be a leader and a guide for my family. So that's that's number one. That's That's my main value proposition that I need to focus on other than, you know, my career is secondary to that. Um, but, uh, I definitely, in my career, I, I try to build my skills to be valuable in the marketplace. And I, I try to, um, give more to my company. I try to, I try to be fair to the company I work for and make sure that I'm giving what I need to there. And I, I want to say giving my all, uh, but, but, Sometimes that's not the case, um, but uh, you know, I, I need to. I basically, I don't want to cheat any company that I work for. I want to have a fair value exchange, if that makes sense. But uh, but yeah, the biggest value I can bring in life is is number one to my family and friends, and you know, 
everything else is kind of secondary to that, in my opinion. It was great talking with you, Stuart. Uh, you brought a really nice and fresh perspective on the things uh, that you usually talk about, uh, Bitcoin and frugality and, and, and life in general. Um, before I let you go, uh, where can uh, people reach out to you? Where can people reach you in the, in the best way? Is there like a, a way they can get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, probably the best way is um, I'm Stu Frugal on Twitter. That's S-T-U. F R U. I mean, I think people know how to spell frugal, but S T U is what I go by on on there. Um, and I've got my own little podcast called Bitcoin and Financial Dependence. It's a, a solo show for the most part. I rarely have guests. Uh, we talked about this before the show a little bit, but yeah, I uh, need to be a little bit more consistent in having episodes. But it, it is very hard with a a growing young family at this point in life. So. Uh, trying to trying to uh, do that when I can, uh, but yeah, that's that's where you can follow me the most. Probably is on Twitter and Noster 